Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Geneal Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County Lecture Series for April 4th, 2023. This is Genealogy Basics Occupation with speaker Kathy Andrews. To join this event uh, using a telephone only in case your internet drops out, you might want to jot down one of the numbers, 1-888-788-0099. And then slowly enter the webinar ID of 8856-473-4266. And then we're taking questions as usual. So if you're joining by a computer, you may use that Q&A icon down at the bottom of your Zoom control bar to type your questions. And then if you're on a mobile, it may be up in the upper right hand corner of the screen, depending on the size of the mobile device you're using. And I'll now turn it over to Gail Burke to get our program going. Over to you, Gail. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon. We are glad to see all of you here for today's program. This program is presented in partnership with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries on the library's Zoom meetings platform. We thank our library partners, Sarah Jones, Victor Willis, and Jessica Goodman for their assistance in supporting our programs. In a moment, we will get to today's presentation. First though, we have a few announcements. The Society's DNA Special Interest Group met earlier today and we will meet again next on Tuesday, May 2nd at 10 a.m. The DNA SIG meets in person in the upstairs meeting room at the downtown library. Look for reminder notices about the time and place of the next DNA session. If you're interested in seeing the handouts from past DNA special interest group meetings, you can access those at the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County webpage under the category lecture recordings and handouts. And I will put the URL for our society in the chat. The upstairs meeting room at the library is reserved by the Genealogy Society for all our Tuesday meetings, including the Zoom programs. The society displays the Zoom presentations on the large monitor and society members are available after the programs to answer questions that attendees may have. It's a fun way to participate in the Zoom programs in person. For details, contact Mike, Mike Epperson or join us at 1 p.m. in the library meeting room. As an enticement to attend in person, we are offering cookies. If you have not yet signed up to be a volunteer staffer, please join us. We staff the genealogy room at the downtown library Monday through Sunday. Each shift is only two and one half hours long, and it's an opportunity to become more familiar with our reference collection. Our staffing roster will be complete if each of you will help by staffing just one day per month. Please volunteer to staff by emailing the society at staff at scgensoc.org. We are always eager to receive articles of genealogical interest for our newsletter. The next quarterly issue will be the April, May, June issue and is due out shortly. Please send articles about your genealogical endeavors, successes, and research tips to our editor, Lisa Robinson. We also hope to feature your genealogical brick walls in upcoming newsletters, so tell us where you're stymied. For our May program, we have scheduled Barbara Ray Venter, a well-known forensic genetic genealogist who will give a presentation about investigative genetic genealogy. In June, Kathy Nielsen will make a repeat appearance and present a program about what to do with our family research and heirlooms. Today, we're privileged to have Kathy Andrews as our speaker. Kathy will show us how knowing an ancestor, ancestor's occupation can help us to understand more about our ancestor's life. Investigating an ancestor's occupation can open doors to further research and help with challenges such as distinguishing between individuals with the same name. Kathy will review some common resources and explore some uncommon strategies to identify the work our ancestors did. She will explain how to find existing records and documents and help us understand more about the world in which our ancestors lived. Kathy Andrews is Senior Adult Services Librarian with the Salinas Public Library, where she teaches the Genealogy Basics series and oversees genealogical resources, services, and programming. Because she grew up in a family where stories and details about ancestors were woven into every family gathering, she has a deep appreciation for genealogy's challenges and rewards. Please join me in giving Kathy Andrews a warm Zoom welcome. 
Thanks, Gail. Um, I'm very happy to be here. This is one of my favorite things to do, uh, is to teach people um, on just about any topic you can think of. Uh, let me go right into my PowerPoint here by sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the reasons I picked this particular theme for the um, PowerPoint was because this uh, this made me think of leaving uh, as an occupation. So um, the three main points we're going to work over today. Uh, the first one is um, why bother looking up occupations. The second is where to look for occupation information. And the third is what kind of records are available about specific kinds of jobs. When it comes to why occupations matter, um, if you really think about it, it's one of the things we do most uh, during our day. Um, many people identify with their jobs. Uh, even if they don't want to identify with their jobs. It's often one of the first things that we talk about when we're meeting someone new. Whether that's um, working for yourself or working in a small company or working for a large corporation, um, it makes a difference to um, both our self-identification and how others identify us. When you're looking for occupation information, it can often lead to other kinds of records. Um, if you know someone's occupation or have the first clue about what their occupation was, um, that can help direct your uh, inquiries and it may take you to some of the um, non-population schedules of the census. It may take you to a general internet search. Um, it might even be something like tax records. Uh, where the um, information about the person, though more general than vital statistics, uh, will still give you information that is useful. Um, you know, and you can look up, there are some jobs that have uh, many records. There are other jobs um, that you may just want to do a simple search. Um, if you believe you have Cornish mine workers in your family, then something like migration patterns of Cornish miners may help you focus in on um, more information uh, since people often came over in groups and went where other people they knew were, for example. One of the great things about occupations is it can really provide a glimpse of what life was like. And in fact, when I was um, Reviewing the slideshow to get it ready for this particular setting, uh, I ran across an occupation that I'll use as a little bit of a, a, a case study. Uh, if you don't know what a shingle weaver is, you'll know soon. And believe me, it really gives you a sense of what life was like for the folks who were in that occupation. Um, my grandma, before she moved from Canada to the United States, worked in the candy factory in uh, Nova Scotia, in Hansport, where she was from. Um, and I was able to look up, there's lots of historical information about that, it turns out. Um, there's information about uh, American street food, the vendor that we were looking at with the cart um, dishing something up in his, in his uh, work apron, um, that street food. There's all kinds of information that can give real context um, to what it was they were doing and how it fit into daily life at that time. Another nice thing about occupations is it can help distinguish individuals. One of the things I've learned over the years is that ancestors' names that seem unfamiliar to me now um, might have been uh, very popular um, names. And even in the smallest, least populated communities, it's not unusual to run into people who share the same name. Um, you know, the city directories are one of the things we're going to talk about as a way to find um, find occupations. And I just picked this one example, uh, and I took a relatively common name. So here's a city directory from, from Detroit. 
from uh, 1878, and I'm going to zoom in just on one section. So uh, very common last name, Smith. Um, and you can see that there are a number of um, same first name, uh, but you're able to tell, you know, um, Albert the baker is not the same as Albert the bookkeeper. Um, Alexander H, who's the canvasser, is not the same as Alexander the grocer. Um, we can see different addresses. Uh, so you can see on down this very simple selection from the list um, that it can really help make a difference. And like all information, um, you're going to be looking for other confirmation. Uh, this can be an important piece of identifying uh, an ancestor and telling them apart from all the other same named ancestors in the area. When it comes to finding your ancestor's occupation, um, there are some very predictable sources, and one of the good ones um, is the U.S. Census. In the initial uh, census from 1790 to 1840, um, occupation was not something that, that was being recorded. 1850, which is a breakthrough year for census, because that's when every person in the household was listed, um, is also where we start to get occupation information. Um, it was looking specifically at this time for males over 15 years of age. By 1860, it was looking at, um, uh, you know, any person uh, over, over 16, uh, over 15 years of age, um, though in many cases, it's just the head of household or an elder son whose uh, their occupations are listed. By the time we get further along, every single person, regardless of age, is having something written for occupation. Um, that includes school children or children too young to be in school who are just listed as at home. By the time we get up to the most recently available census, which is the 1950 census, which came online just almost exactly a year ago this week, um, you can see that there's even more information. We've got both the occupation and what industry the person is working in. Um, for example, Ernest Andrews uh, was the assistant postmaster working for the U.S. Post Office. I see Ernest a lot today. He's my granddad and is super handy for examples um, because he had both some of the things that could go really right for finding examples and things that go, could go really wrong for finding examples. They're also, um, the non-population schedules are everything from, uh, because everything with the census is called a schedule. The population schedules, what we were just looking at, the non-population schedules are the ones, in this case, this is um, 1870, we're looking at uh, products of industry. Um, and so we've got the corporation, the company, or the individual, um, what kind of work they were doing, and it even goes so far as what kind of inventory they had. The mortality schedule there, it was really, it was um, 50, 60, 70, and 80. 18, 50, 60, 70, and 80. Uh, the 1885 mortality schedule was on a limited number of states. Um, I think it was the state, it was actually brand new states or territories that were about to become states. Um, so the mortality schedule doesn't happen every year, and it's only for people who died in the census year, so in the year preceding the date of the census, um, and this one being June 1st, Gideon Drake uh, had died, and we find out that his um, occupation was farmer. Um, so um, many other people... Um, Either it might not have been known, or if they were women, it might not have been listed because um, keeping house uh, uh, was um, not considered a uh, occupation in in that strict sense. So 
the last two pictures are actually, um, this is uh, Irving Pettit, uh, who is a great, great grand uncle of mine and who took over the harness making shop from his uh, father, my great, great grandfather, uh, Cyrus Pettit. Um, this picture from 1914, the, um, the harness shop looks like it's definitely a harness shop, even though this is in Michigan, we know that there were automobiles that were becoming more available, but there were still, um, there weren't really tractors so much to use yet. So um, all the work on the farms uh, or pulling someone into town uh, for the day would have been done by horses. Um, this one, which is from the 1920s, I believe, is uh, you can see that some of the changes are happening. Uh, 1916, so even a few years later, some of the changes are happening. Um, you know, he's got bicycle tires uh, and bike repair um, is one of the things that uh, uh, that he's added to the list. Um, when we look at this is the 1910 census. So here's Irving. We bring that right across. We can see uh, this essentially says harness maker in a leather shop. 1920 census. Here again is Irving, um, harness maker in a shop. <clears throat> Here he is again. Um, now he's a cobbler in a shoe shop. Um, it's still the same shop, but the transition has happened between 1920 and 1930. Um, and then by the time we get to the 1940 census, uh, here's Irving as the proprietor of a shoe and leather shop. Um, so when you're able to track someone through a number of uh, years of the census, um, then you can see some real changes over time. Um, often they're reflective of what's going on in the country as a whole at the time. When it comes to the vital records, um, many but not all birth certificates include the parents' occupations. Uh, and this is an example of one where um, Estella has been born in uh, 1920. Um, her father is a farmer, her mother is a housewife. When we look at marriage records, um, you can see uh, that the um, occupation uh, uh, is listed. Um, lots and lots of farmers in this community. And then when we get to death records, um, before death certificates were common, but once vital records about death were being created, um, often there was an index like this kept at the county level. Um, and again, uh, you've got occupation. Um, this is a time period when, when many uh, youngsters were dying. So that's why there's so many um, blank spots here. But you know, here's a, a particular uh, young woman, Libby, who died at um, just shy of being 18 um, and who was already a school teacher. Uh, so even the records that we often rely on for birth, death, marriage um, statistics, and often we can find parents or other family members listed, many of them also include occupation. Once the death certificates were very common, here's one, and we'll refer back to Lorenzo um, later, but on his death certificate, he's listed as a fireman um, on a stationary engine. Uh, if you just looked up what, what we typically think of as a fireman today, um, that's a very different thing. And we'll see from some of the other records that um, he was not actually uh, on the fire brigade, um, but working in a situation where he was uh, stoking a stationary engine. Here's another example. Um, this gentleman uh, had a poultry store. Talking about death, um, obituaries are often a good place to find out about someone's um, work that can apply to both men and women in this circumstance. Um, if young women, uh, even though 
it was very common that uh, once married women would come out of the workforce um, or their uh, unpaid, unrecognized work would still go on if they were helping run a farm. Um, here's one uh, Mrs. Crow um, mentions her son and daughter and uh, um, one of the most popular and successful teachers in the county before her marriage. Here's that daughter, Jeanette, um, who passed away a number of years later uh, and lists her information as a teacher. Um, tax records are a record that um, I find really fascinating because uh, often people don't think of looking at them there aren't tax records available of every sort, uh, but there are many kinds that are available. Um, and in this particular case, uh, this is a tax record I found through um, ancestry.com. Uh, it doesn't give a lot of other specifics. There's nothing about the nature of the family. The person's age is not in there, um, but it does give, um, in this case, part of the calculation of the taxes is for licenses. And so we've got um, a wholesaler, we've got a lawyer, someone who runs an eating house, a retailer of L being liquor. Um, so the different kinds of jobs that would have required licenses, um, a couple of manufacturers down here, um, you can find some broad information about, about their name and where they were, but in this case, the licenses is the relevant part for the occupations. This is a very fuzzy one. Um, I'm sorry it's not better, but most of the examples I've seen from the Civil War tax rolls um, are, don't come out too much better. Um, but again, we've got uh, information about the person, um, articles that are being taxed or occupation. So some things, um, you know, this person uh, has cattle that were slaughtered, um, hogs that were slaughtered, um, someone else, uh, you know, other, we can make a guess about them being, um, being farmers. Here's a physician. Um, here's someone who uh, makes clothing. So wool manufacturer. So lots of information. Um, and again, it depends on what's being taxed is what's going to show up. Um, so in this case, it's uh, it has to do with the uh, um, income tax. Uh, in this case, for businesses. When it comes to city directories, again, um, these are a great way, not every directory everywhere has information about the occupation, but almost all of them do. Um, almost all of them list uh, the, if it's a couple, they'll often list the wife. And if the wife has an occupation, they'll list that as well. Um, coming in closer on this, you can see, um, you know, these folks were the employees of this of a particular company. Everybody in town knew what those companies were. Now, I happen to know from researching family that um, Grays Harbor was uh, primarily about the lumber industry. Um, so chances are good that those, especially if those names show up a lot, um, chances are good that you'd be able to do some research um, and begin to find information about some of the local industries. But you can see we've got grocers, we've got dressmakers, nurses, um, meat cutters, so all sorts of different occupations. Um, and, uh, and down here, uh, Zale Archer was a shingle weaver. And I thought, well, um, what are shingle weavers? Uh, I think of wood shingles, I don't think of weaving with them. One of the very first things that came up when I did a quick search of what are shingle weavers was information about um, the right in the Grays Harbor area, the lumber industry, 
and the shingle weavers, um, because of the power saws that are used to make the shingles, um, it's very uh, dirty and extremely dangerous work. Uh, there's also all the dust from the wood um, that's a problem. And so um, these were very successful unions that were formed for the shingle weavers. Um, I'm gonna leave this up for a second and let you read this. This is from the Wikipedia page about shingle weavers, but and then from Sunset Magazine describing the job, but go ahead and read that for a, set, for a moment. So as you're reading through that, you get a sense really of exactly how dangerous um, this work was uh, and that uh, um, the cedar asthma, which is super common with anybody who does a lot of woodworking or cutting wood is that you would have problems from wood dust. In this case, it's the cedar trees um, being turned into shingles, uh, but the, um, the loss of a finger, hand, or part of an arm um, makes it really clear exactly how dangerous that was and why it would have been um, unionized. Uh, these couple of pictures um, are from, uh, I could not find the exact date. My guess is that they are from the um, 60s, 70s, possibly as late as the 80s. Uh, so relatively contemporary, but you can see um, this is the guy who's doing the cutting. This is the guy who is getting the shingles um, stacked so they can be bound together and sent out. If you think back to the Victorian period and all the Queen Anne houses with shingles on them, both for decoration and for roofing, um, and all the houses that have shingles of one sort or another, cedar shingles, cedar shakes, on them of one sort or another now, you can understand why this was such a busy industry. So in this case, um, you remember Lorenzo Andrews that we had a moment ago. Um, if the first thing I had found was uh, Lorenzo listed as a fireman, um, and if I had not looked up and down the page, I'm a big advocate of taking a look at the actual full document that you're looking at, in the case of the census, um, reading a couple of the census pages before the relative you're interested in and a couple of pages after, in terms of a directory, um, taking a look at other people listed and flipping a couple of pages um, through, you can start to see that um, this is a railroad uh, railroad worker community. Here's this man is a fireman on the Grand Trunk Railroad, uh, baggage man on the Grand Trunk Railroad. Um, and so now that we see firemen, but it's not listing a railroad, um, then uh, that actually elicits curiosity at this point, if this were one of the first things you found. And then his death certificate which says that he was a fireman on a stationary engine um, tells you more. Um, if you haven't used directories before, um, let me just point out a couple of things. RES usually stands for residents. Um, that, that person may be uh, owner or they're resident in that, in that building. It usually means they have the whole house to themselves. Um, if we look at Martha Adams, who's a teacher at Central School, she is rooming at 205 Shiawassee Street. Um, here's uh, Hazel Agner, another teacher, also rooming. Um, sometimes you will see uh, B, D, S, or just B for boards. So they are boarding at 502 Mercer. Um, so those are some of the common uh, abbreviations that you'll find in um, directories.
Some other examples of places that you can find information about occupations. Uh, here is Ernest again. This is his draft registration card for World War I. Um, I love this card because it confirmed for me, uh, it's the first time I found out where he had been born. I knew what county, but not what town. Um, and here it is, it's uh, 1918 and he's doing auto repair. Um, he's in business with another man at 260 Trumbull Avenue in Detroit. Um, so not far from where Tiger Stadium would go up. Um, and uh, who knows, I've, I've done some exploration of that neighborhood to try to figure out if um, his business might've been in that same area. It's one of those urban areas where there's storefronts on the first floor and apartments above. Um, when we look at Ernest, here's for the, the old man's uh, draft registration for World War II. Um, by this point, uh, he is um, working for uh, the US Post Office. And again, when I found that first information, the first draft card about Ernest um, uh, doing uh, car repair, uh, this is another directory that I found um, from pre-1918. I think it was from 1915. He's listed as an auto worker. Um, that may have just been one of the categories. I don't know if he was working for Ford or one of the other companies, or if that was the handiest one for having an auto repair business, still exploring that. But uh, he's at the same the same address, boarding at 260 Trumbull. Here's another example of so, some of the kind of uh, information you may be able to track down. A lot of the information for people who are traveling, getting passports. Um, emigrating to another company is going to have some information about uh, their profession. Um, in this case, and in many cases, it has information about the parents as well. Um, so here's uh, Louise, who usually went by Louie. Um, and she, uh, we're looking at Brazil. Um, it's got information about her parents. And she's a teacher. Um, this is an example of a passport application uh, from a particular time period. This is 1920, I believe. And uh, um, the Winhams were a well-known family in Salinas uh, at the time. Um, the father had been part of um, the town when it was getting started. He was quite involved with um, spreckles, with sugar. Uh, the sugar industry, as well as being uh, an apothecary in town. And here's his son, who is a petroleum geologist, uh, because of some other family, uh, not my family, but other family research that I'm doing. You know, in the 1920s, petroleum geology was a brand new thing. So, um, you know, if you saw uh, William Pitt Winham's uh, information 10 to 15 years before this, it wouldn't have said petroleum geologist. It might have said geologist, um, might have been um, some kind of engineering, uh, et cetera. But um, these passport applications can be quite interesting. They also generally include a picture of the person. So in this case, when the second page is turned, I didn't put this into the presentation, but when the second page is turned, you've also got an actual picture of the person. Um, and sometimes it's if a husband, wife, and child are traveling to somewhere, there will be a, an actual, um, I mean, it's purpose taken for the passport, but it's a picture of the, um, the family unit uh, together. There's also generally information about um, not the mother so much necessarily, but for sure the father at this point would be listed, whether they were a natural born um, citizen or had emigrated themselves, uh, what their birthplace was, etc. I recognize this as uh, 
library card catalogs. This is actually the Library of Congress. Um, the, the backside, the folks working on all the um, cards for all the books in the Library of Congress. When it comes to trying to figure out what an old occupation is, um, there are websites that are specific uh, to gathering information and details of, uh, in order to define um, occupations that are either rare today or have, um, uh, you know, have uh, uh, gone out of style. Um, this is just one example. Um, and anytime you're doing a search about um, old occupations or uh, looking for a definition of an occupation, you're likely to get this kind of a website coming up as part of your search results. Um, and so this one uh, has, you can see that's quite a, um, quite a large set of old occupations uh, beginning with A. One of the things I would mention is it's never a bad idea to take a look at the definition of a job in the time period, because there are jobs whose name we have today, but whose actual work is different than it might have been at the time period that your ancestor was employed uh, that way. But you can see, you know, if you look look through this, and this looks like one of the sites that might have a um, a tilt towards uh, British. Um, genealogy, um, but there's lots of lots of different um, old occupations. The other thing you can do is to just do a um, a quick search. Um, something came up, and I I had always made an assumption about what a cord waner was, um, and I had assumed it had to do with rope making. But when I looked it up, turns out that's uh, an old fashioned name for shoemakers. So that can, you know, just a simple search and sorting through the results um, can start to get you some more information about what a particular job was. And again, if you think about <laughs> the information that, that I dug up about shingle weavers, um, and I have a really good idea what uh, that gentleman who was a shingle weaver was doing. Um, and what his daily life was like um, in that time period, which um, I am always in favor of having context for ancestors. It's more than just names and dates and times and places. Um, it's what people were doing at the time. That gives you a real sense of who those folks were. There are some fields that have uh, records that are either easy to find or there's a predictable research strategy to find them. Um, and whether it's, you know, Pullman or a big corporate uh, manufacturer, this picture is actually um, workers in the Salinas area on an experimental USDA um, agriculture exper experimental farm and they are working with something called guayul, which was a replacement for rubber. Um, and there was, it's actually a shrub that's planted, lasts several years, um, gets harvested, gets processed, and can be turned into rubber. Um, and it was, uh, it was tried in the run up to World War II and during the war, um, because rubber was gonna be one of the things that was in short supply. And so this is when thing, the guayul has been processed and it's been on these drying racks and now they're um, taking it off the drying racks so it can be turned into products like tires. So some of the easiest occupations or professions to identify are railroad workers, apprentices, craftsmen, any licensed trades or professions, and then corporations, businesses, merchants. When it comes to railroad workers, there are lots and lots of records. The main thing you're gonna to need to do in order to research 
is um, if there is a way to find out what railroad the person worked for, you remember the example we had earlier with the Grand Trunk Railroad, you need to know which railroad it was. You need to know what year, um, because there was a lot of movement in the rail industry. Um, rail companies came in and went out of business, were bought out by others. Um, so what year it was will have an impact on what information you can find. And then the location. Um, there were many uh, small railroads that didn't go outside of a particular state. Um, in, some in some places and at some time periods, they may have only run across several counties. Um, but the location is going to make a difference, whether they're one of the national, uh, nation-spanning railroads or whether they're a more regional one. Oh, let me also mention, uh, beyond the railroad workers, the, the um, Pullman porters uh, are another part of the railroad industry uh, that has uh, relatively extensive documentation. Um, about uh, about their work. In the US, there weren't guilds in the same way that there were training guilds in um, in Europe. Uh, and but there still was apprenticeship. And typically someone coming into a trade would start as an apprentice, become a journeyman, and then um, at a certain skill level would be recognized as a craftsman. Apprentices often started at very young ages. Um, sometimes uh, orphans um, were placed into apprenticeships because then the craftsman that they were working with was responsible for um, their room and board, uh, some basic clothing, and teaching them a trade. The record of the agreement for apprenticeship is called an indenture. Um, and uh, same same title still used uh, to recognize that um, today, if someone enters into an apprenticeship, it's a legal document. It spells out both what the apprentice is going to do and what their um, the apprentice's master is going to provide in terms of training, in terms of um, uh, sustaining them during the period that they are an apprentice. A journeyman was called a journeyman because this is a point where they often were going to work for other craftsmen, not who they had been apprenticed with, um, but learning more about the trade uh, nearly at the point that they could be considered a craftsman. When you're going to search, if you have an inkling that there's an apprenticeship involved, if someone has a trade, it was a craftsman in their trade, they may have learned it from uh, their father, but if they entered into an apprentice agreement with someone else, the way to start the search is to um, use the state name and the word indentures, and that will bring up different states have different rules about things. Um, there are extensive records in some states and in some cities or towns uh, there are either non-existent or missing records in other places. So you want to start with the very general, the name of the state and the word indentures and take it from there. Any of the licensed professions, so uh, a surgeon um, or doctor, uh, an apothecary, pharmacist, uh, barbers were licensed. Um, Longer ago, I guess they still are now. Certain standards have to be met. When it comes to uh, taverns and inns, especially if the place sold alcohol, um, there would have been licensing. And then um, for any profession, you can look for information about the licenses. Um, most professions kept some kind of a day book which recorded the work that was done that day, who it was done with or for. Uh, and then the account books would have been where each customer essentially had a page or multiple pages um, over time listing uh, how much was owed, was it paid, et cetera. The day books would be like if a, doc a doctor's day book 
would record, you know, whose house they stopped at first, what they um, did for that person, uh, and then anything that they dispensed or were charging for. Um, that information then would go into the account book when they went to see um, the Brown family and did something for the child who had um, broken an arm. Afterwards, that daybook information would go into the account book and Mr. Brown's account would list, you know, the visit and the fixing the broken arm uh, and what the charge was. When Mr. Brown came in and paid, then the account book would show that Mr. Brown had paid. Um, and sometimes, depending on what it is, you might find uh, payment in kind. So, uh, you know, the delivery of um, a bushel of, of potatoes or the delivery of some hens uh, in the country setting as opposed to cash. Um, all three of those kinds of things exist. Not all of them have been saved. Um, it may be that you're looking, uh, contacting the historical society, the genealogical society in that town or that county. You may end up looking at the state historical society, genealogical society um, records to try to identify the state archives even to try to um, see if they have any records for a particular field or person. When it comes to merchants and businesses, obviously um, you're gonna find them in directories, typically not only for their listing, but it's worth flipping through to see if you can find any of their ads. Um, the advertising that people did. So if you uh, make use of newspapers um, and get a look at, uh, you know, search for the name, sometimes um, in the late 18th, early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, there weren't always the uh, sort of, you know, show ads. Um, the splashy ads, there often were things in the want ads or the things offered for sale where it would be, you know, just the simple uh, list of, you know, such and such a grocery has now received a new shipment from New York City. Uh, you know, everyone is welcome to come in and view all the different linens or um, grocery goods or whatever. Uh, so the advertising could be helpful. Larger corporations typically have some kind of corporate records. Um, some of them are um, have been digitized and are available, again, often through um, either the corporation, uh, if there's a the equivalent of an interest group for whatever the corporation is making. If it was a big enough corporate citizen, it, again, might be might have ended up in the State Historical Society or State Archives. Um, there are also, for merchants and businesses, there are the account books, the day books, there might be promotional pieces. If a business has been open for a number of years that's worthy of an anniversary, 25 years in business, 50 years in business, those are the kind of times when, um, when businesses typically might pr produce some kind of a promotional piece that would tell you about the founding of the company, um, the life of the founder, the name of the excuse me of the family members who have taken over, taken over, um, other information, you know, employees who've been with the company for the entire time or for a significant number of years. So there can be a lot of information um, about businesses that. Um, if you have some interest in it because of the location your ancestor lived or if they were involved in the business, it's surprising what kind of things you can find. Um, again, anything that you find, you're going to want to take a look at. Often the stories of the founding of the business, um, depending on how long ago it was and how much it's been cleaned up in the interim to be socially acceptable, may only bear a passing resemblance to what actually happened at the time that it was founded. So um, fascinating stuff to find, be ready to dig a little deeper to have a sense of whether that was the um, popular story being told by the company or whether it bears some resemblance to what actually happened at the time period. America was a country of farmers until it 
wasn't. Um, today, less than 3% of the population is involved in the agricultural industry, and that includes farmers. Um, you know, here in the Salinas Valley, we've got lots of uh, processing plants, uh, lots of wholesalers. Um, there would be, uh, you know, the harness makers, the um, blacksmiths. Uh, so we hit a point in the late 1800s after the Industrial Revolution where there was um, farming got a little easier because of the machinery and a lot of people were leaving the farm because um, life was more predictable in many ways when you're working in a small town in a large city working for a corporation rather than relying on the weather. Um, but there are many kinds of different records you can look for for farmers. Um, one would be any kind of probate records. Um, and that may list information about what the what was produced at the farm, uh, who is involved, um, what where the land was, those sorts of things. There was a specific agricultural census in 1850, 60, and 70. Um, the census keeps track of lots of agricultural data still, but like many other parts of the census, it's now on an almost continuous basis where they're surveying things um, from year to year, every couple of years or every five years. Uh, so there's lots of information about agriculture. You don't have to wait for the decennial census. Um, but during the 1800s, uh, the ag census was a big part of the actual census. There was also a manufacturer census that ran much longer. One of the reasons that's related to farmers is because in most locations, farming is a seasonal business and farming doesn't pay all the bills. And so many farmers had a second kind of job. Um, they may have been uh, a blacksmith, um, they may have manufactured uh, furniture, repaired things. Um, they might have logged in the winter, um, farmed all through the growing season, and then um, turned the um, the lumber uh, at their, you know, established the sawmill for their own use, which then might have been used by other people as well. A number of farmers had... Um, uh, grain mills, uh, you know, to grind the, the um, wheat, et cetera, down into flour. So it's not unusual. If you have someone who's a farmer, it's worth double checking the manufacturer's census in those years to see if you can find specific information. Some of the older ones, the information is not available on individuals but it would give you a sense of, for a specific location, what kinds of manufacturing was going on. It may not tell you about your specific ancestor, but would give you a sense of what was going on locally, more locally. Land records, of course. Um, and this is one place where, along with some of the probate records, where you may find the women in the family mentioned. Um, because depending on uh, whether the land records related to their dower interests um, or were gifted to them um, in a will, uh, you, you may find more about women in the land records. And then um, tenant records, not every farmer owned land or even those who did own some land may have rented other land and it is not unusual that the tenant would be responsible for the taxes um, to be paid directly to the government. And so there are times when someone who didn't own any land is going to show up in the tax records about that land because they're responsible for the information. All right, I do just want to mention uh, at the Salinas Public Library, we do have a genealogy collection. Um, it is uh, smaller than Santa Cruz's collection, but it is available. We have both items that can be checked out. 
and items that are available for reference use in the library itself. If you are doing any research on Salinas area history, we do have a local history section as well. Uh, we have a rather large clipping file, which um, fingers crossed at some point that will all be digitized and available to everyone. Uh, we also have the Salinas Californian back into the early days before it was called the Salinas Californian. And then in those big blue um, shelves, we have yearbooks from the high schools in Salinas. Both of those are available for use um, in the library itself. And uh, give and take with genealogy, we have a genealogy work group that meets the fourth Tuesday of every month from six to seven. It's a chance for folks to share information. Um, it can get pretty lonely doing genealogy if it's just you at the computer or you on your way to a courthouse. And so the work group is a chance to talk with others about what they're doing. Um, because it's a repeating group, uh, we don't post the Zoom link, but we are happy to share it. Um, and you can get that from me. Um, and uh, we just talked about Ancestry.com uh, and how to uh, make the best use, some tips and tricks for that. Um, in coming months, there's a number, we usually have a focal um, topic for the month and, and then um, also share resources and uh, new things that we're learning. And then you are also welcome at the Genealogy Basics class series. Uh, I don't have the dates set for summer yet, but I always do getting started as the first of the um, three in a row. Uh, that will be in June. In July, uh, it'll be information about writing your family history. And in August, one of my favorite classes to teach, deciphering old writing. Um, for more information, you're welcome to email me. You can also at saliniaspubliclibrary.org on the calendar. You can scroll through those months. It'll probably be at least another week before I have the actual dates set. But uh, the classes are free, and we uh, welcome anyone who'd like to join us. You're welcome to reach out to me. Um, there's my email, and reach out to the library as a whole. Um, if you have any kind of questions, or uh, sometimes uh, when folks are feeling stuck, um, just a couple of moments consulting together, we can come up with some ideas of what to try next. Um, so I'm happy to, and I'm sure uh, the Santa Cruz folks, uh, you're welcome to share my contact info with anybody, um, anybody who would like it. All right. Sarah, I'm betting we have a few questions. Well, we're going to have to see. I think that we may have a group at the library. So Victor or Gail, maybe you can let me know how this is working these days. Last The last time we had a program, we had a larger group in the at the library itself. So I'm not sure how they're putting in questions. So uh, there is a question. It says, where do we look for railroad records for an ancestor once we have identified which railroad they worked for? So that's that's exactly uh, once you know the name of the railroad, then you're going to um, enter the on a do a search by um, putting in the railroad name, the year or years, and then um, what the location is, uh, what city or what state it's headquartered, and that will bring up any possible records. There also are some. Um, I don't have any railroaders, so I'm I. Uh, don't use them, but there are sites that will help you find where the um, where the railroad records are. Um, there are some composite sites that will then lead you to the specific railroad sites. Then I have another question. Do you have any suggestions on people who were boilermakers? Boilermakers, uh, the steel industry, the first thing I would want to know is what town they were in. And if they're a boilermaker, then they're probably working for a pretty large uh, steel company. 
Um, and whether that were Pittsburgh or Detroit or some other, um, maybe Cincinnati or somewhere, um, I would start drilling down if you don't know what business they, you know, what company they worked for, but you know where they were, um, I would start drilling down on what Boilermakers were in that town or that locality. Um, you may also find in the directory, if you can find directories for the time period, uh, it may list who their employer was, and that would get you to the name of the company. And there's, um, I just am always astonished that when I put in the name of a itty bitty company that's been out of business for a hundred years, you know, somebody out there cares about it and has information on a website. So tiny companies, big companies, there's going to be information out there. Um, bringing it down to the level of your ancestor proving that they work there. Um, again, the directories and some other, some other pieces. Um, sometimes the death certificate would list the company. The company may also be listed in the census. Sometimes the, the enumerators seem to write down the name of the industry and other times they substituted the name of the company um, instead of the name of the industry. Uh, so, you know, auto, auto um, assembly line worker, Ford Motor Company versus assembly line worker, automotive industry. Um, so some of that's going to depend a little bit on how closely the enumerator followed the instructions. Got it. And you have another question on a different career. Any information on woodmaker finisher? Time period would be interesting to know because um, if they were working for one of the furniture manufacturers, um, there are towns that are extremely well known for furniture manufacturing. I grew up in Michigan and the Grand Rapids area on the west side of the state was one of the um, central places in the US that people went, merchants went to buy the furniture. Um, it's now uh, typically North Carolina then was the next place. Um, so whether they worked for a large manufacturer or were working for a small manufacturer or a specialty company um, would make a lot of difference to how to track that, track that down. Um, so that the time period would probably make a difference to whether there would be uh, the possibility of some records that might mention individual employees. Great, thank you. How about um, you know, uh, school teachers? I know that there tends to be a lot of information on the women who who worked at those different types of boarding schools and things like that. But I mean, if you want to keep digging and digging and digging, or is there a great place to go to find information? There, uh, so depending on, the, and the time period is going to have a bit of an impact, but one of the places you're going to find out the most about school teachers is going to be in local newspapers. Um, and if you have access to um, newspapers.com or know how to use um, Google Books to find newspapers, uh, Lisa Louise Cook has a great um, uh, training on how to do that uh, by way of example. Um, there's going to be information on public school teachers in uh, newspapers. In some cities, um, some, some places kept records of the schools, and in some cases there might be a published history or there may be access to uh, records. Again, it might be through the local historical society, local genealogical society, but um, you often can track back you know, and find out if someone graduated from, you know, the normal school, which is where the sort of before uh, educational colleges were called colleges, they were usually called normal schools. Um, so, and in a small town, the school teacher would have been, school teachers would have been people that everybody knew. Um, so there's likely to be a lot of information that way. And I'm wondering what, what professions are the easiest to find information on and which professions are the most challenging? 
just so that people are either, you know, feeling positive, like maybe they'll be able to find the information or, you know, maybe set their expectation accordingly. I think that when you're looking at industrial revolution, so 1850, 1860, 1870 and on, um, there, there may be more information about the trade, um, depending on what the trade was, uh, that may affect, you know, if there was a company with 100 clerks that was in business for 10 years um, and didn't necessarily make a big stir at the time or did at the time and nobody's paid attention after, that might be a little trickier to, to follow up. But it's um, local makes a difference uh, because every business in every town made the newspaper. Um, and and the machinations of the owners and the competition between different people doing the same or similar work um, shows up in, I've recently been doing a lot of newspaper research of all different kinds. Um, and it's amazing to see, you know, here's a company that announces they're going to go do something and you don't see anything about it ever again. Um, here's a company that's you know, launching another business and, and they're having a grand opening and they're you know, sponsoring local um, uh, softball teams. And, you know, so I would, I would start by thinking local um, for whatever the field is. If it's about someone who is a farmer and it's in the first hundred years or before, you know, in colonial days, you're probably, you are gonna find some records, depending on where you are, you might find a lot of records. Um, but you're going to have more blanks to fill in uh, than, than um, you know, some of the more recent professions. When everybody was a farmer, no one wrote about it that much as something interesting, other than the noble farmer. <laughs> All right, another question that's come in straight to me. It says, can you discuss what kinds of occupations we might find information about in academic papers, such as maybe doctoral thesis? So interestingly enough, in almost every profession I've looked at that that is um, has more than 10 people doing it, um, it is not unusual as you start going down through search results that you'll find something, uh, you know, it may be related to the economic aspects of whatever that occupation or industry is. Um, it may be related to health, uh, to unions. Um, you know, the union information about shingle weavers was really, um, like there is a whole lot to explore there. Um, I know there's been at least one book written about, about that industry and in the unions. Um, but uh, you know the um, the academic papers may be coming at it, um, you know, not necessarily recording how the occupation did its work, but the impacts on people who are in that occupation. Um, but I'm sure there are. I'm sure on many occupations that there have been learned studies. Um, uh, and if you're talking about something like teaching, you would really need to think specifically about how to narrow that down once you start looking, because everything about teaching has been studied um, with varying outcomes, you know, for many years. All right. And someone uh, sent in a, here's an interesting human tidbit. Uh, I found one ancestor on the 1860 census where everyone else was a farmer, farmer, blacksmith, farmer. But my ancestor's occupation was gone to California. Oh, yep. Yep. That's pretty good. Yeah. Cause there were a whole lot. I have a relative who went from Michigan to California. Um, got smart and sold supplies to the other miners and then came home with gold in their pocket, not because they found gold, ah. <laughs> because they, you know, made money in a way that was more reliable. So, yeah, because I'm sure when you look at the instructions for any census, it's, you know, someone whose usual abode is at this place and the folks heading off to California, most of them were going to go strike it rich and come home. They weren't going to stay. So, um, 
that would that would make some sense. I love that. And then, I mean, I I've seen this myself. What are we What are we to infer if it's blank? You know, if it doesn't say unemployed, I mean, we can't just assume they went to California. I mean, that'd be a fun story. But what do we infer from blank? So um, we infer that the that the enumerator wasn't sure what to do, or that the person didn't want to tell them uh, for whatever reason, um, or you know, because the enumerators weren't able to talk to every single family. So sometimes they were talking to the neighbors if they couldn't find uh, and the the family you know available, sure. um, or they were just asked to make you know gather information and make their best estimate. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be concerned if it were blank. Um, I would just keep looking, you know, and especially if the person shows up in the 10 years before or 10 years after. I mean, there are some, uh, I love the ones where the person identifies themselves as a capitalist. Yeah. Were they a business owner? <laughs> Did they have income that they, you know, that they inherited? Like what the, you know, I haven't gone specifically back to the <laughs> instructions for the, for that census to see if, if that was actually one of the categories that was to be used. Um, you know, some people have uh, own income, OWN income um, in their uh, occupation, which means they were a gentleman of leisure, you know, um, weren't forced to work. Uh, so yeah, I would just keep looking and use all the use all the tools. I have another very specific question that came to me. It says, uh, I'd love to know what records might talk about South Carolina pre-1800 as it pertains to careers maybe for um, immigrants. Like, where do you go? So um, you're going to want to get to know South Carolina very well. In the pre-1800s, most of um, most of America was along the coast. Now it doesn't mean that they worked for um, the you know uh, ocean-going businesses, but um, one of the great things about the colonial times and then the early days of the country is that records were often kept on a town by town basis, sometimes the local town or township government, sometimes the church. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's information. I mean, if you look at the first census and look at the breakdown by states, I don't remember if it goes to counties. Counties would have been very different at that time, but you can get a sense of um, what people's you know, what percent were farmers uh, or working in agriculture, et cetera. But um, I would really, and I would look for the historical societies and genealogical societies on a county or town basis. Um, you know, if you know roughly where the person was in the state um, and you can track some information as possible to find out how the county names changed over time, right? There's a website that has an interactive map for any state in the country, and it'll show you year by year how the, because, you know, first the state was one county and the state was three times as big, and then it was broken down into smaller parts. So the location, the county they're in, they're located in where that city is today might have had a really different county name or been shared by another county that does still exist. So the records might be a couple different places. But um, when you get back to pre-1800, and especially as you edge back towards the early 17 and the 1600s, um, those are some of the most studied people in America, uh, American history. Um, and so, it, it depends a little, you know, if things got destroyed during the Civil War, there's not going to be as many records, but um, that could have some really juicy information. And then I have another specific question about my bo Boilermaker question. I had mm -hmm. to step away when you're talking about fire, um, fire department. What's the, what would be the link between someone who was listed as a fireman and then their family members who were Boilermakers? So chances are good uh, in that circumstance that 
I, I mean, you'd want to do more research, but the fireman may have been the person that was um, heating up the uh, structures, you know, the furnaces that were going to make the steel that was then going to be shaped into the boilers. Mm, okay. um, so they wouldn't have been working with the hot steel. They would have been, you know, shoveling coal or whatever in uh, to keep it hot enough to pr provide the raw materials that then would be turned into boilers. And then you did have a follow-up question when uh, the person asked about the woodmaker finisher. They said it was uh, 1900s. Yeah, if you know what location they're in, um, I would take a look at some of the information for that location and see if you can tell if they were working on a, in a small company or for themselves versus whether they were working for a manufacturer. Um, you know, the manufacturers would have broken it down. There were the people who were putting, you know, making the lumber into the right shape to be furniture. Um, there were the people who were assembling it. There were the people who were finishing it. Um, it's also possible that they had a small shop of their own uh, and were turning out or repairing um, individual pieces and finishing Strangely, I used to have a furniture restoration business. Um, and so, you know, the people who are doing the finishing, that's a whole separate thing from the woodworking. So, um, you know, if they were part of a smaller company uh, or part of a bigger company, it would probably make a difference to finding out more information. Got it. Thank you. Well, it does look like that's the end of the question. So, Gail, what do you think? Kathy, I appreciate your expertise here. This has been super fun. I, that, For whatever reason, I found this career as one to be pretty interesting because, <laughs> you know, it's like grounded in what we all either do day to day now. You know, yeah. it seems very tangible compared to some other types of genealogy types of things. So anyway, well, I appreciate it. Thank you, you very much. It's easy to overlook and it makes such a difference to understanding the people in the families. So. Yeah, and I'm a directory nerd. I love going through the directories. So that's about the extent of my genealogy expertise. <laughs> Kathy, thank you for giving us lots of new ideas about how to incorporate information about ancestors' occupations into our research. I especially appreciated uh, your mentioning some lesser known uh, resources. And I can see I've got my work cut out for me. <laughs> <laughs> Today's program, a couple of you asked about a handout. There is not a handout for this program, but today's program has been recorded and it will soon be posted on the library's YouTube channel where we can all watch it again. And if you have not saved the chat, uh, I put uh, instructions in the chat about how to save it. You click on the three little dots and then click on save chat. And you might wanna do that now before, you, uh, before the end of the program. And that way you'll get everything that's in the chat. Thank you for being with us today. Please join us again on the first Tuesday of May, May 2nd at 1 p.m. for a Zoom presentation by Barbara Ray Venter, a well-known forensic genealogist who will present a program about investigative genetic genealogy. You can register to receive the Zoom link on the Santa Cruz Public Library's events calendar. We also invite you to visit the Genealogy Society website. I put that address in the chat as well. When you visit the Genealogy Society website, you will find the membership application form there. If you are not already a member of GSSCC, we cordially invite you to join our society. We look forward to welcoming new members. And then Sarah will show you back on the uh, registration page. To register for our programs, all you need to do is enter your first and last name and your email address. And you can check the optional little yes box if you'd like to receive information about a variety of events from the Genealogy Society. Once you click the blue register button, you'll receive the Zoom information for the next program. Uh, thank you again for joining us this afternoon, and we hope to see you next month. Bye, everyone. Thanks again, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. You bet.